Our supposedly advanced modern world in the so-called information age is a bit of a paradox because there's a depressingly large percentage of people who ignore, refuse, and reject reality. Rather than accepting the evidence indicating that this planet formed naturally as a gradual gravitational concretion more than four and a half billion years ago and was subsequently infused with evolving life well more than three and a half billion years ago, these people prefer to pretend that our world was literally spoken out of nothing by an incantation spell just a few thousand years ago. Many of them also believe that sometime in the last few thousand years, a global flood occurred, wiping out all life on the planet in a cataclysmic event, all except for a floating zoo built by a 600-year-old man. Having been raised to believe in the biblical fable of Noah's Ark has convinced people that anything they see in nature, up to and including rainbows, somehow qualifies as evidence of their global flood. Experts in every relevant scientific specialty insist that this is categorically incorrect, that there is no record of this type of event in the history of the planet from any field of study, though there are many fields that in and of themselves disprove the flood fantasy. Adding all the lines of evidence together, the biblical flood is thoroughly impossible. It could not and certainly did not happen the way the Bible describes. Having already explained how meteorology, geology, and paleontology each disprove the global flood myth, we now look primarily at botany because there are plants that live a lot longer than most any animal, and this video is mostly concerned with ages and dates. How did young earth creationists decide that the universe was only 6,000 years old? A 17th century monk added up the obviously dubious ages of generations of fictional characters from his favorite folklore, and from that he determined that the world was magically created on October 23rd, 4004 BCE. Using the same method, one of his contemporaries had previously calculated the exact same date, but somehow more precisely, concluding that creation occurred at 9 o'clock in the morning. Because when you can't tell the difference between knowledge and make-believe, then you may as well imagine that knowing the age in years will also tell you the time of day. Young Earth creationists don't always adhere to a 6,000-year-old universe. They'll move the goalposts as far back as 10,000 years when they have to, and we'll take that into account as well. Not all creationists are young earthers either. Remember that creationists aren't just anyone who believes that a god created. Some prominent evolutionary scientists believe that too. Creationism is a form of religious extremism requiring a delusional deny of reality, where sacred dogma takes precedence over demonstrable truth, being based on an assumption of unquestionable authority rather than factual evidence. So it is an unreasonable position assumed without reason and defended against all reason. By definition, creationists reject evolution specifically, but more importantly, they're opposed to scientific methodology in general, arguing instead for what is essentially magic, even if they don't accept or won't admit that that's what that amounts to. Some creationists admit to an old earth, but even then, their version of biological history is often all wrong, and if they believe in Noah's flood at all, then they're figuratively still in the same boat with the hardcore science deniers. But the leading propaganda mills of this type of resistance to reality do hold to a 6,021-year-old world, and they hold similarly specific dates for their mythic flood, too. Answers in Genesis said it happened in 2370 BCE. Institute for Creation Research said that it was in 2348 BCE, and Creation.com says it was 2304 BCE. Amusingly, they all used the same method to arrive at different dates. I'll explain how we know that all of their estimates are wrong later in this series. For right now, understand that these are the leading authorities for all of creationism, and all these believers agree that according to the scriptures that they worship, their flood should have happened less than 4,387 years ago. We have trees older than that. This bristlecone pine, for example, was once famously hailed as the oldest living individual organism on Earth. At 4,765 years old, this tree would have been three or four hundred years old at the start of Noah's flood. The way we know that is with dendrochronology, the study of tree rings. Trees in temperate zones follow an annual cycle of seasons where early spring growth is faster and thus the wood is a lighter color. But as growth slows down again in autumn, the wood is denser and thus darker, creating a sequence of one additional ring for each year of growth. Using this knowledge, dendrochronologists can accurately tell us how old a tree was when it died, or in the case of modern trees, when it was cut down. Or they can drill pencil-thin core samples into living trees to see how old they still are. 
Tree rings also indicate the climate in that year. A larger ring indicates a good year for rainfall and a smaller ring a bad year. Prolonged winter conditions could slow growth to a stop or skipping a year, while mid-season drought conditions could appear as two different growth periods within a single year, but either of those require particularly extreme non-repeating conditions and both can be corroborated by other trees around that one. So it is possible to match overlapping ring sequences in several generations of trees, giving a record of the climate that stretches well beyond the age of any one tree by itself. And this has been done with bristlecone pines, tracing a record of continuous growth stretching more than 8,000 years without any hint of a global flood. And this prompts apologists to concoct whatever excuse they can to deny those overlapping generations. But for the moment, we're only talking about one generation, one individual. Even though this type of tree only thrives in very dry desert areas, creationists insist that there were so many mid-season droughts as to throw the dates off, arguing that the tree couldn't have sprouted until immediately after their flood had subsided. And notice in that statement is an admission that the tree could not have lived through the flood itself. No plant on earth could. Not even plants that live in the water could have survived those conditions, but especially not any of the vegetation that those animals would have had to have had the moment they got off the ark. Imagine all those elephants, rhinos, buffalo, locusts, and everything else having to go on starving while they wait for their crops to sprout in salted ground after a year-long deluge. Imagine koalas having to swim back to Australia, only to find that there's no eucalyptus trees there either. Not yet. They'd have to wait a couple of years before there'd be enough of anything to eat. Remember, young earth creationists believe that dinosaurs were on the ark too, along with calicotheres, titantotheres, and drichotheres, and a whole lot of other things that eat hundreds of pounds of plants per day, and there wouldn't be anything for any of them to eat. Birds and monkeys and sloths wouldn't have any trees to climb in or nest on for many years. Really, it wouldn't happen at all, because all the soil would be ruined such that most plants would never be able to germinate or sprout. No matter what kind of animals we're talking about, what they eat or where they're supposed to get back to, all of the animals on the ark, carnivores and herbivores alike, would starve to death, most within the first month after they landed. Young earth creationists generally accept the absolute age of the oldest tree they know about because they think they can still squeeze it into their worldview somehow by rationalizing that it's younger than it really is and that it impossibly sprouted immediately after their impossible flood. But what they don't know is that there was another bristlecone pine that was found to be even older than that one. At 5,066 years old, the oldest individual tree in the world was already close to 700 years old before the date of their flood. And that's not all. This Norwegian spruce in Sweden is a clone. The trunk that is growing there now may only be a couple centuries old, but the genetically identical material from the root system that sprouted it and others before it was carbon dated at 9,558 years old. And it doesn't show record of a global flood either. And that's still not all. There are a number of other clonal organisms that scientists have determined by combining dendrochronology with radiocarbon dating or various other means to be extremely old, like these yuccas and creosote bushes at 12,000 years old each. These leaves on the ground are really the top of a clonal tree that lived entirely underground for 13,000 years. The pando is a forest of 47,000 genetically identical clones, all emerging from an interconnected root system that is essentially a single male aspen tree, estimated to be at least 80,000 years old. And there are other clonal organisms even older than that. But let's forget about estimates with uncertainties and focus on what we know absolutely. Let's not forget about individual trees and the fact that other species besides bristle cones have been shown to have overlapping sequences of matching rings. The longest continuous tree ring chronology so far is a series of oak and pine sequences spanning 12,460 years before present. That's several generations of trees living through normal conditions, covering the entire Holocene and part of the Pleistocene well into the Ice Age with, again, no hint of a global flood, not even in those times where we know that some of the biggest floods in history have actually happened. They just didn't affect this part of Northern Europe. Now that's not even mentioning fossil trees like Arizona's petrified forest. Those trees are so old that their rings can't be correlated with any living trees. But fossil trees can be correlated to each other, as we see in Yellowstone National Park's Specimen Ridge. Here we find evidence of 27 forests 
not 27 trees, 27 forests preserved in volcanic sediment, with each forest being buried on top of another. How is this possible? Observing present-day volcanoes and their effect on the environment, now we can make sense of this. Starting with the first, in Consequa, the bottommost forest, we find a volcano erupting in what was called the Eocene Epoch. The animals flee this eruption, thus leaving very few of their fossils, but the trees, unable to do anything but stand firmly in their spots, are buried by the volcanic eruption. However, they're not completely buried. Any trunks or branches not covered in ash will rot, preserving only the parts that are covered. The volcanic dust also preserved in its layers leaves, twigs from conifers, deciduous trees, and ferns. Igneous rock takes about 200 years to decay into soil suitable to start you know, to support large forests again, following the last volcanic eruption until the next one. At Specimen Ridge, this process has repeated itself 27 times. So if we count only the period between the destruction and reformation of fertile soil, that alone brings us to an age of 5,400 years, still within the creationist timescale. We need more than just rotting volcanic rock to date this forest, and serendipitously, these trees still have their growth rings. Using dendrochronology, we can see that the oldest trees in each of the 27 forests in this geologic stack is around 500 years old. 27 such generations gives us an age of about 13,500 years. Then, we must add in the amount of time that it takes to start growing such old forests, 200 years between each cycle for new soil. That gives us an age of 700 years for each layer of forest that we see. Multiply this by the 27 layers, and this formation must be, at minimum, 18,900 years old. A Y minimum because it's possible that volcanic rock took longer to become soil, or growing conditions might not always be suitable at the 200-year decay range to start supporting a new forest. And these trees might max out at 500 years, so that some of them might already be dead by the next eruption. And that's if we completely ignore all of the radiometric dating methods used to confirm that this repetitious cycle began in the Eocene epoch 55 million years ago. You don't just throw out the facts every time they dispute your favorite storybook. You throw out the man-made mythology when you see that it's wrong. So how do we know these forests are stacked on top of each other and not simply buried in one fell swoop with roots somewhat attached? Simple. Complete root systems have been found directly attached to the trunks of many of these trees. Even better, they show no signs of having been broken off the roots in any manner. But couldn't the flood have dragged the dirt with these tree roots, thusly causing them to still stand upright because the weight would cause them to sink root first? Not really. Again, we look at modern times to figure out how the past behaved. In today's modern floods, which have also torn up trees by their roots, this weighted sinking did not occur. Instead, the trees were deposited laying on their sides, with most of their roots stripped away. In this Yellowstone fossil formation, there is a 12-foot tall, 26 and a half foot round fossil redwood that has roots as large as that of any modern tree, but they're embedded in solid rock. Nearby this redwood are two pine trees, each about 15 feet tall and showing complete root systems. In order to demonstrate an individual layer, we need to have root systems immediately connected to the tree trunk. That is exactly what we would see today. And sure enough, we have the top of a trunk that is eroded away thanks to rot directly below the roots of another tree. There is a hypothesis, to be inappropriately kind, among creationists that after the flood, things grew rapidly to fill up the earth again to the life scale that we see today. Presumably life slowed down once we reached anything that humans would recognize as being particularly old. If this is the case, we can predict that we will see evidence of all ancient trees correlating tree rings, that they would have all started growth in the same year, and that we could predict that they would show giant growth rings toward the middle of these. And yet again, creationist predictions fall short. Still staying at Specimen Ridge, we see that the trees there have rings of varying size. This tells us the rainfall varied from year to year then, just as it does today. As mentioned before, dendrochronologists have used these tree rings to date the oldest trees in their formation to 500 years. Remember that this is per-layered forest. If indeed all the trees in this entire formation died in the same year, we would expect the rings to be identical. However, this is not the case. If the flood supporters were correct, then we would see giant growth rings as mentioned before. 
Again, the claim is not supported by the evidence. There is also a suspicious lack of aquatic species in this formation. If indeed it was a great worldwide flood, we would expect there to be some fish mixed in with these forest deposits. And many of the people watching this video won't care about anything I've said here. They'll object to and reject most of it because polls show that nearly half of Americans believe that the universe is younger than this sponge. And they believe in Noah's flood, even though none of that nonsense could withstand even a moment of critical examination or logical thought. That so many Americans believe in a fable that is just as silly as the stork bringing babies is an indictment of our society's respect for intellect and intellectual honesty. And it is a travesty because it is no accident. The people have been systematically inculcated since early childhood, since before they could even reason, culturally conditioned and misled to believe such absurdities by deliberately deceptive wanna believers who don't care what the facts are because they don't care what the truth is. Whether for the sake of preserving their own delusion or whether they just wanna keep the tithe coming in, they don't want you to know the truth either. But understand that the problem is not just that there's no evidence for a flood, although that should be enough. It's that there is all this evidence against it, too.